Before I make the presentation, I should say a few words about outstanding contributions of this Charter Education Society. The fact that they are running institutions from very beginning till postgraduate, I must emphasize that when you give education in post to postgraduate at postgraduate level, this is without serious research will not be very in the long run very successful. So when you talk about postgraduate ed education, particularly this institution, I think research component should be a very important component. And that must, be, that must be kept in mind. So this is one suggestion I want to make to this Charutar Education Society. And in the long run, <coughs> you know, somebody says that too many institutions and private like a business is like a shop. I think the shop is not bad. When the, with, with course of time, the good institutions will survive, not so bad ones will go down. And good ones will be those which integrate research with their teaching programs. So research is a very essential component. I also must say that uh, this slide is particularly projected. It's a structure of a protein, phycorexin. And I just want to compliment Dr. Datta Madhavar and Dr. Neeraj Singh, who were the maker of this protein. And we are very lucky to interact with them that we did, did their structure. It is a very novel structure where during, during starvation, a protein got truncated and the structure was determined in my lab. <coughs> I think this is the first structure from this university. And I must say that. You know, structure determinations of proteins is a very specialized activity. It happens only in very few countries. And it has been happening only in very few institutions in India as well. And Sadar Patel University, I'm praising for Zatta Madhavar, not necessarily Sadar Patel University, that they thought of making a protein, purify this to the level of homogeneity. And together with them, we determined the structure of this protein. So I must say that this place has contributed the first structure in a university <coughs> from Gujarat. And I would say that not many universities in India are involved in the structure determinations of protein. So in that sense, <laughs> the Sardar, this Anand and Vallabhidyanagar are distinguished. So this is my compliment to these two people. I think somebody said, Dr. Datta Madhavar is a backbone here. And he, this is a, he was backbone of this protein as well. So I'm so delighted that. So it's a very nice feeling. So this is my suggestion to you and your director that I think continue this kind of work. And as your district magistrate said that collaborations and interdisciplinary, these things will happen. So 
research should be seen as most essential component of your postgraduate education. This is essential. Who will move the slides? No? Oh, so this is, this is because of this slide I don't like to show, but I want to show this today because it's all because of contributions by the people like Dr. Dutta Madambar who, who support us in doing more and more protein structures. So from my lab, we are at third position at this moment, and we hope to continue this. So I want to do more structures with you. Thank you. Can we go to the next slide? Next. Now in this line, if you see that, you know, today in biological sciences, the success of biological sciences is primarily dependent on how extensively ge we generate data and put them in a structured manner. So this is one of the international databases where protein structure coordinates and other details are kept in a very structured manner. And this database is exploited by a very large number of investigator, investigators world over, as well as a large number of pharmaceutical companies who are involved in drug development. And from this slide, primary aim is to show this. If you look at the map, the countries which contribute to uh, this database, who submit their co coordinates, I think we can have this slide also, which submit coordinates of the protein structures to this database, the darkness of color indicates the extent of contribution. And if you see that, India is second darkest in the whole world. So Indian contribution to this is more than most countries in Europe and Japan and China is next only to USA. And it's all because of high quality human resource. And I think as repeatedly said that India's strength is its a human resource. And those who are producing these human resource, like the one, like this society, I think they are doing a great contribution to the Indian science as well as economy. So I must uh, compliment you for carrying out these kind of education programs here. So this is a very exciting thing that way. So I, I am very sure that in the coming decades or maybe years, the darkness may grow here more than this, all because of young people. As everybody says that India's real wealth is its young human resource. So I think you should know that how, how important you are when you are going for this education. I also want to say that when you have this kind of things, this kind of research, and the research exploiting Th these sort of data, particularly drug development and pharmaceutical industry, which is all knowledge based. And that will come from the kind of manpower we have. It's all knowledge based and more number of people involved in this will contribute to this, uh, this pharmaceutical industry and other economic programs. Also, I think it is said that India will supply high quality human resources to the world over. The concept of brain drain, brain regain is not an issue anymore as the world has become a global village. So you may be anywhere, no boundaries matter. It's all your inherent strength. Thank you. Next slide. Now coming back to, I think we have lost a lot of time, so I will be very brief. Just uh, when you talk about uh, infectious diseases, there's a, there's a lot of issue today that we are always worried about. Bacterial resistance is growing. All our available drugs, particularly antibiotics, which were a, a very powerful weapon to control bacterial infections, they are no longer very, uh, very strong. We have many bacteria have developed resistance, <coughs> which is a very natural thing. You know, bacteria are also a living thing. And <coughs> every living organism tries to survive. <coughs> so if you are trying to interfere with their life, they will evolve or they will modify, they will change themselves. And that's what they have done over the years. But since they affect mankind, we also get affected. So we also need to revise our ways how to deal with them. So there will be a small concept in this case, what we found that how to deal with bacteria which have become resistant to the currently available medicines, particularly the very powerful antibiotics. 
Next slide. Now when you talk about infections, I will particularly refer a bacterial infections. How do you deal with them? There are four ways I mean, the infections are tackled. The first and foremost thing is innate immunity. All of us, all animals, all, all living organisms have what is known as innate immunity. The germ lines are produce certain kinds of proteins which recognize the invading microbes and by uh, recognizing them they neutralize them. <coughs> so this is innate immunity but so far we have thought that innate immunity in a germline stuff we cannot do anything we don't need to worry about this and not much attention has been paid to this and of course a lot of efforts have been going on about understanding adaptive immunity and how we could make vaccines to fight infections and good vaccines, new vaccines have not been coming in the recent times so there is a problem so this is somewhat very tired approach right now we had a we were very lucky to have antibiotics which were discovered long ago and many antibiotics were made that they were really very powerful to take care of bacterial infections and because they were very powerful investigators and pharmaceutical companies didn't develop many synthetic antibacterials. So the issue now is since bacteria have become resistant to this, we can't make new vaccines since we have not made much progress here and right now we have a difficult situation. We have no new drugs. You have to think about, we never thought of exploiting it, whether we could exploit this. Next slide. This is just to give you some sort of things. You know, sometimes people wonder about, you're talking about that people have challenge, people have, there's a problem of infections, but generations from long back civilization grew and, and populations have been growing in spite of all kinds of challenges, all kinds of difficult infections, people have been surviving. So uh, you always find ways and means how to tackle these things. This is just to give you an idea, when antibiotics were not even known, people were using some kind of materials in this part of the world where civilization started and you can read what is all written here that some rotten molds some different kinds of materials I, I, I don't think we should define one material but large number of material many were fungal uh, growing on rotten things so these were applied and actually uh, infections were treated however people did not know what it contained. They only were applying something and they were observing a beneficial effect, they were happy. So that's how this was the situation when before we uh, knew about antibiotics. Next slide. But when people grow, their knowledge improves, they start asking questions. And in this slide, if you read that, how several people started looking for what these materials contained and the first time in 1928, somewhere, I mean, I must give you this back. 1928, uh, from a fungal growth, you know, investigators in earlier times were interested in new insights, interested in new knowledge. They were not like today's uh, directed research or program research or high profile lab structures or, I mean, good laboratory practices. They were sort of just a hobby and they were not very careful. So Alexander Fleming, one of his labs, he was growing cultures, bacterial cultures, and he was so careless that he left his dishes open and fungal grew on those dishes, some of the dishes. And wherever fungal grew, the bacteria uh, disappeared. So this was a click that there is something which was contained in fungus which could kill bacteria and if you are a prepared mind, somebody pick up that material and from that try to isolate and they found the penicillin was first time discovered in 1928 primarily because observation was made from a fungus, penicillin in fungus. So this is how science began, the discoveries began. So many times making mistakes in science, being careless could lead to exciting discoveries but most of the times it may not. But Right now, since our knowledge has grown, we can systematically grow. 
systematically move in this direction and make discoveries. Next slide. So this is just to give you an idea that once penicillin was identified in 1928 by Alexander Fleming, then subsequently large number of antibiotics were prepared, either isolated from organisms or modified chemically, and situation was very healthy. And I think for a while we felt that bacterial infection could be fought very easily. By the time we came to this period, we started observing this uh, bacterial resistance. And right now, we are at a situation when we were before the discovery of antibiotics, because many multi-drug resistance is a very serious issue, so we have to worry about. So next slide, if you go. Next, okay. This progress, they, that's on synthetic antibacterial, you know, there was a very slow progress. Somebody made fast sulfonamides in 1930s, which very little happened after so many years, and it's still very little happened. So this was a very slow progress. Next slide. This, this is a situation right now, and I have made, written some statement here. And the problem in today's pharmaceutical industry is that, you know, industries also viable only if they make profits. So many industries, particularly when the pricing policies are such that they don't earn enough money, they are very hesitant to invest into R&D. And I have seen myself that in the last 15 years, 15 years before, many Indian pharmaceutical companies were very keen to spend in R&D. Their disinterest has gone down, and I think they are mainly interested in very standard, either generics or lifestyle diseases. They are not investing into these things, and I think this is not a good thing. But we have to make progress in this direction. The, the situation can be much more alarming if we don't find ways and means to tackle bacteria bacterial infections, we may have real problems. Next slide. Now, how do people try to dis make or discover new drugs? There are four basic ways that uh, most people, whether it's pharmaceutical industry or investigators in research lab. This was one of the original ways that you uh, have plant extracts and initially, by way of observations, some plant extracts and then subsequently molecules were isolated and they were used as drugs. Then of course you got this kind of combinatorial chemistry and then we have now one of the most powerful ways is structure based relational drug design which is based on the database that we have enough number of protein structures. The structures of those proteins which are associated with diseases and if the structure of a protein is known associated with a disease looking at the structure of a protein, designing the compounds to control its function is very much possible. But we don't have many, many structures or many target proteins. That's why much progress is not there. Not much progress happening here and not much progress happening here. And also many, many companies and institutions are now involved in creating libraries. Just blindly synthesize compounds. Just modify compounds and make large number of compounds and make libraries. So a lot of pharmaceutical companies are very happy to create libraries. A lot of labs synthesize large number of molecules and they keep on talking. I am using this library to find out a new compound. These are all very vague ways. They are not very certain ways, this and this and this. This is still we need to make more progress. So this is, these are the ways, but we have this limitations. What do we do now? Next slide. So once we will have all the structures of the proteins associated with diseases, this is one approach will definitely succeed. But this is just to, to tell you some approach, we are not getting new molecules, we got some new molecules. But this will be the real solution that once you have a structure, looking at the structure, you get an idea what kind of compound will fit into this, synthesize the compound, do binding studies. If it's a good binding, take to drug trials, otherwise make a complex and identify what more mutations, what more modifications you can do the in the compound. So this is one way that we will succeed eventually. This is a knowledge-based, rational approach. So eventually this will be the way that we will make new compounds. Next slide. However, today I would like to bring in some entirely a new concept. Now, you know, I have mentioned in the beginning that there are two kinds of immune system you have. One is innate immunity. Is it part of a germline? It's a non-specific 
uh, recognition of bacteria, and other one is adaptive immunity. As, as later, th th this man did work long ago, but as late as in 2011, innate immunity was recognized as an important topic. So this <coughs> protein, so the innate immunity. So as soon as you have some foreign thing, uh, bacteria invades you, now they recognize, what do they recognize? Bacteria has a special cell wall, which is human cells don't have that cell wall. So this cell wall is made up of certain compounds, certain polymers like peptidoglycan, like lipopolysaccharides, like lipotechoic acid. These kinds of compounds make the bacterial cell wall. And the best targets for drug discovery are those which are different from those in the humans. So once you design things, molecules for targeting those molecules which are only in bacteria, there would not be any problem of side effects or any problem. So since this kind of thing was, this is just incidentally, no price does not mean much, but since it is so lately recognized, while doing structures of some of the proteins of innate immunity from a variety of animal sources, we found out that these proteins from different animals differ, differ in potencies. See, all these innate immunity proteins, they recognize bacterial cell wall. They bind to peptidoglycans, lipotechoic acid, lipopolysaccharides. These are cell wall molecules hanging out from the cell wall of bacteria. And these proteins bind to these cell wall molecules with very high affinity. Higher the affinity, faster the control. But because of, uh, I think, inefficiency of the innate immunity proteins, because of that sort of thing, the infections continue. Now, what we found out, certain animals have modified their proteins to become more potent than the other animals. Now, this is very, very important that it, it, the way bacteria changed its, uh, I would say, grossly protein to structures where antibiotics bind, they changed that so that they could uh, protect themselves from antibiotics. Similarly, some of the animals which are exposed to more hostile environment where bacterial overload is very high, they modify some of their proteins of the innate immunity. And these proteins were so modified that their affinity to recognize bacterial cell wall molecules became very high. However, there are other animals, including humans, where they didn't modify their proteins so well because they were not into that sort of excessively hostile condition. So what you observe here that innate immunity proteins, although they are part of germline proteins, but some animals have more potent proteins than the other animals. Now we ask a question, can the more potent proteins from those animals, which are protected well, be exploited as therapeutic proteins in case of those animals where potencies are, these proteins have low potency? There are many reasons why they don't need to make high potency. Prime, one of the reasons is that they have other members of the innate immunity, antibacterial team, which have average potency. So they invest averagely on many proteins. No, you, you invest excessively in one only if you are under serious threat. It's like having only nuclear weapons and not conventional weapons. Conventional weapons are OK. But in such a situation, you need to have more powerful one. So that is one the question we asked. And that seems to be the way that if you have these kind of proteins as therapeutic proteins, and since they bind to bacterial cell wall, there is no question of bacterial resistance until bacteria would change whenever, maybe never, its cell wall structure, until they modify peptidoglycans to something else, lipotechoic acid to something else, lipopolysaccharide to something else. These proteins, if they use a therapy proteins, the bacterial resistance issues would not be there. So that is the point. Next slide. So this is the way that in my group we do large number of protein structures. The protein I will talk is from here, this peptidoglyc PGRPS, from where here you can be. And I have included the great group. I would like to continue doing more things with Dr. Madamwar. I think you, you made a serious contribution to our efforts. 
So next slide. So the first and foremost thing is that when you want to check up how these proteins respond, how these proteins respond to certain act functions, you check up their concentration. And if you just see, this is a very basic slide where I picked up the memory gland. Memory gland is one of the most susceptible organs of animals for infection, particularly during lactation. So either you can isolate this protein from the tissues or from the lactation, that milk or colostrum. So if you see that this particular protein is a 18 kDa molecular weight. You see, this is a human case. Is a very there is very little consider. You cannot see the band here. If you see porcine colostrum, it's a very thick band. In normal, afterwards, uh, colostrum is the initial stage. Afterwards, also there is some concentration. In these animals, there is nothing. In camel, this is very high concentration. So in camel and porcine, this concentration of this protein is very high, where other animals have very low. Then you. To see the impact of this, you do epidemiological survey. What happens to, to infections to camel and porcine? And the epidemiological data clearly indicate that the bacterial infections, the, the specific bacterial infection is mastitis, is much less in camels and porcine. Even though their normal immune system, that B and T cell adaptive antibodies, is very weak, but they suffer less from infection. Less from infection, this one here, this, this one here, and this one here. So it shows that this protein, which is a high concentration in these two animals, must be protecting them very strongly as compared to other animals. So it is, it is something like today, if you prepare a protein and analyze the structure, you can think yourself also and modify this to become more potent. However, the, since the, some animals have done it and they have done it over the pe or a long period, it's a very some kind of knowledge based plus trial and error process. So why not take advantage of the situation created by these animals? So it's very clear that this protein of innate immunity, which binds the cell wall molecules, has a very high concentration in camel and porcine and not in other animals. So th what is the impact of this? Next slide. Then you check up with specific cases where you have infection from mastitis. And when the infection occurs, again, this concentration goes very much, it's very less here, very much here when the infection occurs. So this protein is playing a, protein of the innate immune system is playing a very strong role in controlling the infection, the bacterial infection. Next slide. This is just to give you that there are other members of the antibacterial team present in the uh, memory gland and you could see that the concentration of this particular protein we are talking about they have other modes of actions against bacteria but this does through the recognition of the cell wall molecules of bacteria and concentration of this protein here is very high next slide I think go fast otherwise so this peptidoglycan recognition protein has four members that this is the part which recognizes bacterial cell wall molecules and other proteins have this part plus additional part and this one has still more additional part to do additional action but we are concerned with this part which recognizes bacterial cell wall and you will see that how this particular protein from camel and porcine is more powerful very simple the scientific research eventually results are so simple however before we have thought about them they look so complicated. That's what I was saying that many people say, somebody said in Europe that GN Robinson and the so-called Phi map is nothing, it's a trivial concept. But well, until he thought, people did not think about this. This was a very serious concept. So thinking first is unusual. Once you have thought about this, it becomes a simple thing. At the end of the day, science is very simple, but until you have thought, is very complicated. Next slide. It's just to indicate that these proteins ac are expressed at several locations, several sites, particularly all the sites where infections occur. And uh, some of the sites are particularly 
important, I think that this one here, which indicate that they are strongest members of the innate immune system of animals. Next slide. Now, this conclusion what I tried to tell you that how these proteins are more potent is based on structures determined of human protein and the camel protein and also their complexes just to find out including the porcine protein. So having done work from the protein, same protein from different animals, we come to this conclusion that this protein from these two animals is very potent and how to exploit this. Next slide. Generally, I don't want to make you, I mean, this audience is very complicated. So the difference only is that th this particular protein, peptidoglycan recognition protein, in humans and other animals, uh, except camel and porcine, works as a monomer. You see, protein molecules can produce their biological effect as single protein, single molecule, or in combination with dimers, trimers, and tetramers. Sometimes they multiply the binding site, sometimes they make the binding site more, comp more potent. So in this case, the main difference was that camel protein made two dimers, two kinds of dimers, whereas human protein exists only as a monomer. The protein from buffalo, cow, and sheep, goat, they all also are monomers. So next slide. This is just uh, some, the way bacteria has modified some of its proteins to protect it from antibiotics. Camel and porcine have modified their protein by very few mutations, very few changes. And because of these changes, camel protein works as a dimer. Human protein only remains as a monomer because those changes are not there. So crux is that over the period, animals modify their proteins or living beings modify their proteins to primarily fight the adversi adversities. So that's not to give more details, but give you an idea. There are very few mutations here. They are responsible for the camel protein being a dimer. Those mutations are not present in human protein, so that works only as a monomer. So this is a very simple statement. Next slide. So I will not talk details about this, but how these changes convert this protein to dimer, it exists as a dimer. So we, we don't, don't need to go to this detail for to this audience. Next slide. But just some mutations, for example, here and here, they are different amino acids in human protein. So these two molecules cannot come together and, and form a dimer. But in camel protein, these proline, some these amino acids, they find the, the interface so good for dimerization. Just to tell you that it's a real, what real thing is happening. Next slide. Did we move forward? Similarly, this was one dimer, the other dimer also. I think you can go further. Next slide. Here are also some very few changes. Which will next slide. Similarly, just to show that how this dimer is formed, and in human it can only form. Next slide. So this is how you see the cell wall of gram positive and gram negative bacteria. These protruding out molecules are nothing but peptidoglycans and liposteicoic acid and lipopolysaccharides. In humans, they don't have cell walls. So this is a best target if you can exploit this by some thing. Next slide. Similarly, in mycobacteria, you have mostly myconic acid, uh, fatty acids coming out. They, they are also a very good target. Next slide. So the best normally as a scientist you will do in the lab that a protein from camel is dimer from human is monomer. How, how strongly it binds to these bacterial cell wall molecules like PGN, LPS, and LTA as compared to the human protein. The best way to do experiment biochemically, just do bi binding study and determine the binding constant. So we picked up some of these cell wall molecules fragments. And next slide. I think you move fast. Oh. Uh, I think some slide perhaps got missed in between. There is a slide which shows binding study. Can you go to the next slide? Yeah, this one, I think the slide came in between. These are the binding study. You can find these binding constant. These numbers, 10 to the power minus, higher the minus value, better the affinity is. So it shows that there is a good affinity. Next slide. Then once you have done the binding studies, the next step you would like to see, what is the mode of binding? Where do these compounds bind to this protein? And the important thing is that in this dimer, they bind here is one molecule and the molecule, the contact point of the dimer. 
You see, dimer is formed in such a way that here is a binding site, and dimer is formed like this. this it becomes a better clef when you have a dimer. So that is why dimerization helps. Next slide. Just to do more, more, uh, with more fragments to generalize that what you are doing is real, not just incidental. Next slide. Now the crux is that just to give you the crux concept. We don't need to talk about details. That this is a camel protein. This is a human protein. Now this is a monomer. This is one dimer. This is two dimers. So in this case, the structure of this molecule is similar to the structure of the camel protein monomer. But because of few changes, this exists as a dimer, this exists as a monomer. The structure of this protein is identical in all animals. But just few amino acid changes have converted camel protein into dimer. Human protein remains as a monomer. Now how does it make a difference? Uh, you see in the next slide. See, this is a human protein, peptidoglycan recognition protein, which points to PGN, LPS, LPA, the cell wall molecules of bacteria. And this is where the binding site is, some clef kind of thing, you can see it here. Next slide. So if you put this compound LPA, it binds here. So when you talk about interactions between two molecules, the interaction is stronger if they have a large contact region. And if they have large contact region, they will make many attractive interactions. The interaction will be weak if they have limited contact. Hence, they will have limited number of interactions. So you can see here, this is interacting with this. This protein is interacting with the cell wall molecule like this. Some interactions are there. But some part of the cell wall molecules are not even reached by this protein. Just to give you that, how it could make it. Next slide. Similarly, LPA, next slide. This is PGN. So they all bind here. This is the binding site. Now if you compare with the camel protein, whose monomer, whose structure is identical, three dimensional structure, except that it's dimer. So if you go to the next slide, so monomer absolutely superimposing. If camel protein was a monomer, there was no difference whatsoever. But because it's a dimer, next slide. You see it's a dimer. It's now you can see all the most of the parts of these compounds, the cell wall molecules, are buried inside this dimeric cleft. The monomers, monomer had a very shallow cleft. And because it was very shallow, there were only few attractive interactions. Hence, binding affinity was low. But now, the cleft has become much more, so it becomes a very powerful cleft. So by changing few amino acids, this animal changed the function of this protein, made it far more potent than those animals which could not convert its protein into dimeric form. So this is where the nature has done. This is what we could also do in the lab, but nature has done over the period. And if you want to do in the lab, it will also take a while. But this is already ready. So this, this can be taken. And this dimeric protein could be used as a very powerful antibacterial agent. Next slide. Very quickly. Just not worry about details. Next slide. So again, just to give you an idea, you know, when you look, when you have a protein structure in front of you, if you look at the protein structure, the way you describe, if you look at a human being, you describe its shape and morphology, everything. You look at a protein structure, look at the binding site, it gives you an idea as to what kind of compound will fit into this. So as a dimer which Camel made, this one, looking at this site, it was very clear to someone who can understand the structure that it will bind to fatty acids. And very quickly, I just finished a few more slides. Next slide. Then we tried that whether the other dimer binds to fatty acids. So picked up some fatty acid components. Next slide. Similarly, here also we did this, this uh, biochemical binding studies. They showed significance. Next slide. I think this slide has gone before, but it doesn't matter. So here again, we compare this dimer and this monomer. How does it do that? Next slide. So this is a monomer of human protein. Where do fatty acids bind to this molecule? See, other thing was binding somewhere here. But fatty acids bind here. Can you show the next slide? Binding here. Next. Next. See, they are binding. Some interactions are here. But then if you go to the camel dimer, can you go to the dimer? Next slide. Structure is identical, but once you have a dimer, next slide. You see, it's again the cleft. 
So one dimer is like this, other dimer is like this. This is for gram positive, gram negative bacteria, and this is for compounds like myconic acid, which is a cell wall molecule of tuberculosis. So this dimer is specific to this, and as a dimer, it's far more potent than the monomer, which is there in other animals. So next slide. We go to the next slide. So what it means that you have now camel protein forms two dimers. One is specific to gram positive and gram negative bacteria. Other one is specific to mycobacterium tuberculosis. And so this is for this binds to mycobacterium tuberculosis. This binds to other cell wall molecules. So this protein is very powerful. Powerful because it works as a dimer, one for TB, another one for other bacterial infections. So, and human protein is a monomer, and because its potency is several fold high, if this protein is used as therapeutic protein, it will control infections much more effectively than the human proteins have been doing. Next slide. Now, just to prove this point, I, I personally feel that once you are demonstrated biochemically and structurally, so very clearly, there is no need to do further experiments, but I think the protocols require just to check on cell lines, and cell lines to check when you challenge this by these lipopolysaccharides and all other agents, there's, there's certain inflammatory indicating molecules like TNL5, L6, they are expressed, and you can see that this is control, and this is with LPS, and this is with LPS for this protein, so it shows just to tell you that on cell lines, this protein shows very strong effect. So it, it should, once you see at the molecular level so very precisely, at cell, cellular level and animal level, it will definitely work. However, I think biologists have a habit of talking more about cell lines and animals. But I think to understand at the molecular level, it, it should be ultimate and final. Next slide. Similarly, you, you do the same experiments on cell lines of mycobacterium tuberculosis. Next slide. Then you do some experiment on, on actual animals that you give a lethal dose of LPS. You see the mice dies in 24 hours. You give the LPS. Okay. So it's showing effect as it ought to show that. So ultimate understanding comes when you are looking at things at molecular level. You know their binding affinity. You know their mode of binding. So it works. Next slide. Then, of course, this is a very crude experiment. You do put the, this protein on the bacterial cultures. You can see some is killing the hair. But this is not very serious. This is very crude experiment. Next slide. Microbiologists like to do this kind of experiments. Got some other one. So what this protein does, the main function of this protein, peptidoglycan recognition protein, is that as soon as it there are bacteria, it, is get, it gets attracted to the bacterial cell wall molecules and binds to bacteria with very high affinity, something like sequestering the bacteria through interactions at these sites. So higher the affinity of this protein, which is much higher in camel protein than the human protein, it sequesters bacteria very rapidly. If protein concentration is enough, if affinity is high enough, it can neutralize infections in no time only when the affinity is low and concentration of protein is low. That all is related to a poor innate immunity of living beings. There would be a problem. But once you have this, it's perfect, perfect way of treatment. Next slide. Now this is just to compare how, what is the kinetics, how does it compare? And I don't want to go into detail because we need to save time. But its kinetics is more similar to the antibiotics because it shows effect through cell wall and not through the membrane as other two components do that. So we don't need to uh, spend time on this. Next slide. Now based on this, you draw some kind of guidelines, some kind of conclusions, primarily to say that these proteins from camel and porcine are very powerful antibacterial agents because they have high affinity to bacterial cell wall molecules. And they can be exploited as therapeutic agents call these proteins as protein antibiotics or antibiotic agents. And that's what we conclude based on these studies. The next slide. Okay, so I normally don't recall, don't 
is what has been done by one or two people, but normally a lot of things we do in a group. So this is a kind of group which, of course, size keeps on growing and uh, becoming small. But these many numbers, some of them have gone, many of them are here, new ones have joined. So thank you very much. So take home message here is that if you have to worry about resistant bacteria, the best course at this moment is this kind of uh, protein from the innate immune system from those animals which have much higher potency than the humans. And then it could be a very powerful treatment. Thank you very much. How do these two types of dimers are formed in camel? And now can one also modify human protein to make one kind of dimer and the other kind of dimer alone? You see, as I showed, I didn't describe the detail, but a protein is uh, made up of amino acids. And amino acids determine how this protein folds. And only very two, actually two amino acids on the surface changed to some other amino acids, like histidine and arginine changed to proline. And once you have proline instead of histidine and arginine, the, the surface becomes compatible to form a dimer. So two changes, they made, so it made one kind of dimer. Now, on the other, uh, surf, other surface, some amino only two or three amino changed, and they made other kind of dimer. So the, the crux is that, I think sometimes it's very exciting nature does, that as a, these two things happen in a way that the cleft was the contact point. See, if the binding cleft is somewhere else, and it's making a dimer, it will not make any change. So you can control these amino acid mutations to make one kind of dimer and don't change the other side. And you can control to make other kind of dimer and like this. So either, since the structure of the oral protein is identical to the camel, we can also use this protein, the camel protein as a therapeutic molecule. And the battery would be that we modify the human protein, clone it and make these two mutations and make it a dimer to to fight uh, gram-positive, gram-negative bacteria, or fight mycobacterium tuberculosis. This has not been done, but this can be done, and this could be a very powerful therapeutic agent. Lots of times people argue at this moment that we never thought about this, we never talked about this. Innate immunity, nobody bothers. The germline thing, don't worry. So it is in a way a little bit surprising to some extent, but once you make the observations, this becomes the real, real direction. And I think this is one way that we have a hope. I feel that way very strongly. Dr. Ram Chand. You are going out or you are taking mic? <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK, thank you. I thought he was asking a question. <laughs> Any queries from audience? Queries, comments, and questions. Some other, other uh, organism may have a better potency against the bacteria. Uh, it may have trimer or tetramer, some other yeah. better uh, stable protein. Yeah, you see, you know, this, uh, when you do your investigations, the large number of investigators, when they do one structure, then they have knowledge about the structure and they will make mutations and play with these mutations, find out their properties, find out their effects. What we have been doing in my lab all the time, that when we work on not the bacterial proteins which we clone, on the proteins when we isolate from natural system, if we isolate from one animal, we try to isolate from all possible animals and compare their structure. And that's where the difference was found. So this is one way that if you are working on natural proteins, isolating from tissues or from any secretion, it would be interesting that if you compare, if you do structures of these proteins from all possible species. And that's where this difference was observed. Otherwise, one could have spent time in doing mutations on the human protein and keep on playing, keep on publishing papers. And someday you may strike a deal as well. And in other words, knowledge should also tell us that we should be able to do that way. Definitely we'll be able to do that way. But I think this was very quick. And that's why one should uh, be obliged to 
the contributions of animals having done this for us, and that's why it's beneficial. Dr. Ranjan, I'm very sorry to interrupt you. We are old friends. Next question. So the next question is from you. If there is no question. Okay. On behalf of Charotar Education Society and Sri N. Patel PG Institute, I heartily thank you, sir. And uh, um, I assure you, the suggestion which has been given by you that uh, research should be correlated with the uh, PG. You, you have taken yes. <laughs> yes. So 